So over this last 48 hours, my team and I, the Disaster Terminators, decided to create a solution called DisasterBot. So here's our team, and all seven of us. And we wanted to help with natural disasters. So many of us remember Hurricane Maria, which by October 11, 2017, Fox was reported about 81 deaths directly or indirectly caused by the hurricane, which is absolutely terrible and a tragedy, but what happened later on was far, far worse. By August of 27, the University of Puerto Rico published its updated results, saying that about 3,000 excess deaths happened as a result of Hurricane Maria. These were results from about um, since the hurricane to February of 2018, and were caused by things that we think were at least partially preventable. So our solution is a chatbot in Facebook Messenger that would take in a user's location and determine the risk of natural disasters in their area using historical and satellite data. Once we get the list, we can give them a list of supplies they should prepare and other things to do. For example, in case of a cyclone, they need to know how to evacuate and where to evacuate. And furthermore, it would remind the user to keep up to date with new information. So a better explanation is to do an example of how a user might use our, oh, how a user might use our chatbot. So this is Katie, she's a 23-year-old student who lives in Austin, Texas. And social media is her main source of news and information on many topics. So what we would ideally like to happen is she gets a notification one day that hurricane season is approaching and she should enable this bot in order to help her prepare for the upcoming season. So her first use would be getting her inf location information from, um, from the user through the Facebook API. And then it would give her a list of features to help her prepare. So for example, a preparation list, escape plan, and contacts. She would be able to browse different options in order to get more details. And then once we know what kind of issues she may encounter, we offer ways, um, things that she needs, and how to get them. In this case, if she needs a flashlight, we would also link to Amazon in order to help her get what she needs. Furthermore, we would also give them ongoing reminders in order to help her keep up to date with different things. A common problem is medication, which many people forget to keep up to date and can expire, so it would also remind her when she needs to replace her medication. So here's just a video demo of our chatbot in action. Thank you for your attention. Any questions now? I'm gonna ask the question that other people asked me for, but if you had a few more days, what else would it do? So right now we only check for several types of natural disasters, so we would add support for more natural disasters and look at more data sets that we could use in order to help accurately do it, as well as look at working with other organizations to get extremely accurate preparation lists that would help the user the most. Just to add on really quickly, right? So in terms of the technology side, there's a lot of fun things we can do. Give us two more days, we can add AI onto it. We can add user input onto it, right? So not only do we have past data, we have live data, right? We can, let's say if there's a fire somewhere, user data can, can go into, they can shoot a, a, a location of the fire, and then we, we know where the fire is happening and where it's going, and then we can start warning users in the areas that, that the fire is going. And also we can do other stuff, like um, we can work with, uh, let's say, suppliers of first aid kits, right? So then from our, our chatbot, you can just get that first aid kit right away.
Hey, do we have a launch in? Launch in? Awesome. Launch in. You are up. On deck, we have Save the Woods. The team that is saving the woods on deck. Hello? Hello everyone, uh, thank you very much to all the sponsors and stuff for having us. We are launching. Uh, so, our team here, uh, we got Remy, Nathan, Sam was missing, me, Duncan. I'm gonna blow right through this so we can get to our live demo. Uh, so we chose the challenge uh, to create a launch schedule. Uh, basically, the, the problem is right now that the existing ones kinda suck. Uh, they're, they all have really good information, but they're either updated manually or the site looks like it was built in 1998, uh, which nobody really wants. Uh, so we have a few more things that we're thinking of capitalizing on beyond those two things. That is that uh, live space, space launches and other events are increasing uh, every year. Earlier this year in February, SpaceX uh, successfully launched their Falcon Heavy launch, and they were the second biggest live YouTube event uh, in history with over 2.3 million concurrent views next to another space event, uh, the Red Bull Stratus. Uh, so the media of choice uh, is moving to video. Uh, it's something that users are continually uh, video streaming, Netflix, Twitch, everything. Uh, it's being used to increase user attention, increase brand awareness, and helps uh, users have a higher intent to purchase. Uh, so looking into the future of video, um, virtual reality, 360 video. Uh, it's going to be the next big media channel, and it's not outlandish to think that where in the past we were desktop first websites, in the present we're mobile first websites, in the future we might be VR first websites. Uh, so our solution was to go with a VR reality dashboard. Uh, here's a little bit of concept art I have for you. Uh, some of the basic items are uh, a schedule, uh, the launch countdown, watch live, uh, 3D model of the launch rocket and uh, social media. Really, everything in this app is derived from the schedule, uh, which there's uh, APIs. We use the launch library API. Uh, you'll be able to subscribe to your launch, and uh, when you change your launch that you're selected on, it'll change things like the timer, the 3D model, the social media, the videos you can browse, uh, etc. Uh, so now I'm going to do uh, show you our app. Here's our schedule, so that's hooked up live to uh, the launch API. Got a rocket burning in the background. You can watch uh, your videos side by side. Watch a uh, past launch just before uh, you get ready to interact with uh, some of the scenery. All right, let's see if we can uh, launch this rocket. Yeah, uh, so between uh, the four of us, our teammates, uh, we had uh, our person who's absent today, she focused on getting the, the launch API library working on 
that uh, schedule there. Uh, so while this is live-ish, uh, <laughs> we do actually have it working. Uh, so you know, we're able to go in and play around. Um, but the, so there's the API, the schedule. Uh, we did some 3D modeling animation. Uh, so that's what did the rocket launch. Uh, we had the, the video YouTube integration. Uh, and then uh, like set up testing, uh, kind of the background sort of thing, kind of put you there. A little bit of sound effects too, also Nathan, to really, that's the beautiful thing about VR is being immersed in the world and what it can take you away from, whether it be a confined space or, or otherwise. Good up, good job. Okay, up now we have Save the Woods. On deck, dry ice. Dry ice, you are on deck. Hey guys, I'm Christian Bishru from Team Save the Woods. I want to start off by saying that Space Apps has been a blast. This is my first year at Space Apps and my second hackathon ever, and I'm, I can say for sure that I'm coming back next year. The challenge I picked was the Spot the Fire Challenge. Wildfires are a really big problem for the world right now. Each year, around 340 million hectares of vegetation are burned away due to uh, wildfires. Wildfires are a serious problem in many places, anywhere from British Columbia to California. They can really be dangerous to the people living there too. Wildfires produce lots of toxic gases and have the risk of burning down infrastructure. When I was first browsing through the challenges, I was a little worried that I wouldn't find anything, but then I, that I was truly motivated to work on. But then I found the Spot the Fire Challenge, and I got a great idea. My idea is to develop, is to develop a game of sorts where you can compete with people in your community to get the most points on the Save the Woods app or site. You can gain points by reading articles on wildfires and checking for any wildfire risks in your community. So this will encourage people to be more proactive about wildfire safety and cut down on the risk of a wildfire actually occurring. Here's a brief overview on how my app works. When a wildfire is detected by the satellite, people in the area are notified where it is and are given the option to confirm if the wildfire is actually occurring in case it was just like a false alarm or something. Once enough votes are given, or a member of the local authorities confirms the wildfire, a notification will be sent, signaling the people in the area of the danger, and giving them the time to make the necessary preparations and stay safe. So I have a live demo here. I don't really have a lot of time to go into all of it, but uh, here's the main page. And it has some articles you could read, and then this is just like a sample of uh, top five in my region and a message board. And then here's the satellite data. It gets updated every 15 minutes. So for example, in Madagascar, you can see there's probably some wildfires happening around now. So the next steps for this project are to code an app which tracks points earned and receives notifications to add in a working ranking system, because right now it's just like a placeholder, and to make a page where fire departments and local authorities can sign up and write to a common board. If this idea were to be implemented, it has the potential to save millions of dollars and millions of trees, and not including just saving actual people's lives, right? Taking this idea to the next step would just involve adding in a few main feature and then making the platform more scalable. So I'm Christian from Christian Bishop from Save the Woods, and thank you for listening to my presentation. Interesting stuff. And can, can you tell us how do you actually detect fires from space? So how, how does the satellite actually do that? 
Yeah, so actually I can go back. Um, they have an algorithm, so this specific, um, uh, use the VIRS, VIIRS sensor on the satellite, and it detects uh, my, uh, infrared radiation, which the fires produce, and from there, it uses an algorithm to detect, like, this is NASA, not me, I, I didn't develop it. It um, detects if it's water or not, and like if it's a cloud or something, and then it, it produces a plot of points, and then from there, I took that plot and I put it on a picture. Awesome. Good work. All right, dry ice, are you? No? Okay, following dry ice, CN imports. Do we have CN imports in the building? Yes, we do. All right. On deck, Terra Luna. Terra Luna, you are on deck. Hello everyone, we are Team CN Imports and we are also doing the Spot That Fire Challenge. So in response, we developed a, an interactive map that lets you click anywhere and it will return to you some weather conditions and also it will tell you how likely it is for a wildfire to appear there anytime in the near future. So first off, we'll allow the map to access our location, and this will just center it on wherever our device is located. Uh, also down here we have some cool buttons to like, take you to different continents. We'll start with Australia because they have a lot of fires there. So here, if you click on the map, you see there is a red marker. And here in our legend that says that's a very high risk of having fire. That takes into account a bunch of one of the conditions like the temperature, humidity, and wind speed, and we just chuck that all into the formula down here, which is uh, slightly modified from what the Australian government uses to calculate how, how much risk there is for a fire to appear in any given location. So we can take this up to Canada and anywhere, and you'll see that there isn't that great of a risk except for here in Saskatchewan. So that is most of what we have for the map. And we have a second part of our website, which I will hand off to my peer. All right, so this is our fire sign submissions um, site. So this is, um, this is a crowdsourcing component of the challenge where we take in user input. Um, so um, there is some issues, but there is this video demo of how this works. Um, so there's already um, two markers there, one in Australia, one in Santa Monica, and each marker basically represents a fire location. Um, so if you are a user and there's a fire <laughs> happening in your vicinity, you can report it. So in this example, I just picked Nevada, but you can give it a location title, so Nevada, and type would just be fire, and you click save, and that's basically it. Um, while the demo is really, really simple, um, the idea behind this demo is uh, would be pretty powerful. So, um, the reason why uh, wildfires are so dangerous are because of the unpredictability around if and when they start or where they will start, um, also how quickly they start and how quickly they can spread and how uncontrollable they can become. So, by using this map, um, people like fire watchers and firefighters can report quickly to the public about uh, if a fire has occurred and it's where it's spreading, um, and what kind of 
trajectory or direction it's going in. Um, and as well, um, if we had more time, you could expand this uh, marker. Um, so previously you saw there was type, there was just fire as the only option, but you could also expand this to help people after the fire, so where um, people could find shelter um, or where they could find food and water after um, a fire. Um, so yeah, this is our product. Thank you. So currently there are tools online that show you uh, where current fires are located. Google actually does that, and you'll see that there are actually a lot of fires in California right now. I haven't looked in other parts of the world, but there certainly are going to be a few. And Canada, the, the government of Canada also updates a map daily for uh, risk of fire. However, it's every 24 hours they update it as opposed to uh, being able to show what the current status is in real time. So on our map, you can just click somewhere and it will show you the risk of a fire. Also with um, the fire submissions page, it's getting user input, so just the public. So like even, like even if firefighters are on scene, a wildfire can spread pretty large and not everyone can be everywhere. And so just having public input about where a fire is happening um, can be pretty valuable. Awesome, thank you. Okay, now up we have Tara Luna and then on deck, Pigeon Team. The Pigeon Team. I don't know if that's supposed to say Pigeon, but. Hello everybody, my name is Fatima. My name is Mark. My name is Ash. And we are Terra Luna. So the challenge that we decided to focus on was the mission to the moon. So the essence of the challenge is to use NASA, um, NASA data and basically plan a rover mission to or from to the moon or on the moon. So we all know what our rover is, it's a space exploration vehicle that's designed to move across the moon surface to analyze the surface physical features. That's an example of a rover. So currently there are six rovers on the moon, all are inactive. And to basically plan a mission to the moon using a rover, it takes years of detailed planning and hundreds and, hundreds milli uh, hundreds and millions of dollars. These are some of the initiatives that are currently being used 
in with some space and agencies to basically plan rover missions to the moon. NASA's currently, well, was currently planning a rover mission where they were trying to analyze if there were compounds such as hydrogen and oxygen that are basically related to human life. However, this particular project was canceled and the projected budget of it was about $260 million, which is a lot of money. And for it to be canceled, that's crazy as well. Whereas China is pl currently planning a rover to just analyze the dark side of the moon. None of this has been done as of yet. They plan to do it sometime in 2018. So, what we think we can use, what we, how we think we can solve for this particular challenge is basically using inferred data or satellite images from something like the Lunar Reconnaissance um, Orbiter camera plus image processing in order to come up with Terra Luna. And basically, what the gist of it is that this particular application is meant to help you analyze some of the terrains of the moon and also analyze some of the mineral composition within the moon so we can understand whether there, we can possibly build Earth life on the moon. And my mark will basically demonstrate our application in more detail. Okay, so this is our application named uh, Terra Luma. Terra Luna, sorry. So we guide Amaris rover to its adventure. Amaris means uh, child of the moon, or child of the moon. So we're gonna wait for the loading screen. Is there a Pigeon team in the house? All right. Um, alley cat. Do we have an alley cat? We have an alley cat. All right. Alley cat, you are up next on deck solidity. Solidity is on deck.
Good afternoon, everyone. We are Team Alley Cats, and we created a web-based application called ReadyKit under the topic, Don't Forget the Can Opener. With the world constantly changing through global warming and other natural phenomena, we need a platform to allow individuals to prepare for any kind of natural disaster. Moreover, we still see posters about hurricane preparedness and other emergencies, but with technology being widely used in the world, these fail to be as effective as they once might have been. This web-based application called ReadyKit takes the technological aspect into account when informing the public about the importance of preparing for natural disasters. In the past, according to the Allstate Newsroom, more than 9 in 10 Americans have actually reported having lived through a natural disaster, and 1 in 5 Americans have experienced significant damage to their home by a natural disaster. So now, whether it be an adult or a young child, any individual can access this platform to learn about the different disasters in an easy to understand manner, see the uh, suggested checklist for preparations, and then customize it to their own needs. Users can then make a profile, keep track of their checklist, and add in emergency contacts, keeping all important information in a single location. Being a web app, it is easily accessible to anyone in the world, and thus informing the public globally about preparing for natural disasters. So when the user first logs in, this is the first page that they're going to see. And here we have a list of different disasters taken from the NASA disaster website. The user can click on any of the disasters they wish to learn more about. So for example, in the earthquake section, we have a brief description of the disaster with images. And down below, we also have a section where the user can learn how to prepare for this disaster. On the right side of the page, we have a recommended checklist of things that the user should do in case the disaster occurs. This is extremely valuable to the user because it gives them an idea of how to organize and prepare themselves. They don't have to do extra research, but it gives them a general idea of what to expect. This list can also be personalized, where the user can delete items, add items, and also save the list that they made. So to see the safe list, they can either stay in this page and check, or in case of an emergency, they can go to the checklist, or under their profile, they can also access it. So we can see that the call mom has been added to the checklist. So they also get an option to download this as an image on their personal laptop or computer or phone, so that they can access it offline when the disaster happens that the internet goes down. And in the contacts we have, the user has a list of their close contacts, which they can potentially notify when something happens to them or get notified when something happens to the contact. And in the future, we see the location services being added to this so that we can provide local disaster data that we can grab from the NASA disaster website and give them more personalized disaster data. And we also see it working well on the mobile, mobile phones so that it's easy to access and carry around. As you have seen, one of the strongest points of this application is the clean interface that it offers. Our app not only provides information about natural disasters, but also allows a clean user experience. Through this app, we hope that more users will be able to feel prepared for any kind of natural disaster. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you. And then using the NASA data, we would um, get like satellite data to see what disasters are in their region. And then those would show up like first, so they could like prepare those checklists first. Um, and yeah, and then another thing we would add is um, enable notifications. So if they're on their desktops, like it would show them a notification that it, the disaster is approaching, you should get your checklist list ready. And yeah, that's what we see. Um, can you say anything? Sorry if it's just me that missed it, but uh, really great you know, front end and really nice that you point out that one of the benefits is the clean interface. Um, did you get to do linking to NASA data yet? I know you said that's something you'd get to. Is some of the data that's up there from the NASA database? 
images and uh, we got some of the information that the NASA disaster website offers is added to the actual content of the pages. All right, up on stage now we have Salinity and then on deck we have five guys, burgers and computers. Hopefully with five guys. Hey everybody, uh, we're Team Salinity, my name's Al. I'm Janet. My name's Colin. And I'm Karina. And together, we're really excited to show you the product we developed today called SongSat. SongSat takes on the challenge, Artify the Earth, from a new perspective. Instead of doing visual art, we chose to do uh, auditory art instead. This is a way of representing the world by taking satellite imagery and converting it into music. So we like to call it from turning from bands to a band. For this project, we have three main objectives. The first is to represent satellite imagery through a different medium, so audio instead of visual. And this would appeal to visual audio learners um, because you can have both the satellite imagery and the piece of music side by side. And as a bonus, it would also communicate this imagery to people who had visual impairments. So for our product demonstration, we have chosen three different landscape, each of which have our different themes. So for this to be successful, we need your help, the audience, to take a guess of what landscape is being portrayed in each of the songs. And we would like to encourage you all to just shout out your answer for the first 10 seconds of the song, and you know, just have fun, all right? So without further ado, let's get it going. sentence in a book and turn that into either a melody or chords. 
So this kind of thing does exist, the idea of it, taking non-musical data, transforming into something musical to either give you a new song or just, just an idea to give a writer's block in music and then turn it into something better. Just quickly, and I cannot remember the name of the lady, but there is somebody who um, analyzed data by turning it into music and actually she was like quite a renowned scientist, but I cannot, and I know this because of Rebel Girls. <laughs> I don't know if you guys listen to like Good Night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she was listening to Stars. Good work. All right. So I don't see Five Guys Burgers and Computers, which is a shame because it's a great name. Um, following them is the smell of space. Is the smell of space in the, the smell of space? All right. The smell of space is on stage, on deck. Dude, what agree? Just as we're getting set up, great work, everybody. Um, I'm super impressed by everything that's been presented today. So um, you guys are doing great. So we're the smell of space, and uh, uh, Isan, Todd, and uh, or in the audience, uh, and uh, our challenge that we're um, trying to address today is uh, the so, uh, sending, uh, sharing climate science data uh, from Canadian science uh, or satellites and uh, uh, instruments um, with Canadians. And uh, the problem is that um, humans are changing the climate uh, and we're releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, and uh, climate change is a thinking problem, but what we really need is it to be a feeling and emotional problem um, and get a physical reaction out of uh, people. So the opportunity uh, that we have is uh, to engage people with their senses and share, have them share their experiences uh, with their friends and families, talk about it, and uh, talk about uh, climate change uh, when they have the opportunity. Um, so uh, what we produced was a web application, um, the smell of space, uh, that uh, helps non-experts and uh, um, people from all around uh, the world um, uh, experience this uh, satellite data. Um, and uh, we have a quick uh, demo to show you the website and how we accomplish that, um, and uh, Isan's going to do that uh, uh, very quickly for us. Uh, um. uh, hello everyone, uh, our project uh, has uh, two uh, parts. Uh, first part uh, is our, um, uh, uh, our uh, data pipeline. Uh, 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 CSA provide us some uh, data. provide us some uh, data uh, which are not understandable uh, by uh, uh, even most of experts because the, uh, these are files with uh, some numbers uh, in them and uh, it's hard to understand even uh, there are some invalid data inside that files that uh, cannot be easily uh, removed because uh, it uh, manipulates the consistency of the uh, data set. Um, this is the files that uh, I talked about. Uh, we designed a data pipeline that uh, uh, in one side connects to the source of that data, which is currently uh, the offline data that CSA provides us. And uh, the other side is a database, which is currently a MySQL database. Uh, and uh, it extracts data. and. Uh, process them and put them in uh, that uh, database. Uh, our data pipeline is currently a, a Python uh, project, uh, which is uh, pretty popular with uh, data scientists. And um, we can train it, we can use uh, uh, machine learning to uh, uh, extract uh, more usable data every time and uh, get rid of the data that uh, we don't really want and uh, we can use. Uh, this is the uh, 
data pipeline part. Uh, and on the other side, we have our uh, application. Uh, we choose to develop a uh, web application because we want to everyone have access to that. Um, uh, uh, Canadian taxpayers pay for that uh, satellites that they deserve to have access to uh, those data. And we have three separate parts. First is for experts, and uh, in that, in that um, section, we provide some uh, data for uh, experts. They can use them in the, the popu their, uh, publications. Um, uh, some data like change of the gases over time. Um, we have uh, some... Uh, for non-experts, they don't care about the exact numbers, and uh, but uh, somehow we want to um, uh, increase uh, the public awareness about global warming uh, and show them by uh, graphs that uh, we have a clean air uh, at the beginning of recording that data. Now we uh, polluted our uh, air. That's why we have a, a trash uh, can image in the first page of our website. And uh, uh, we can predict by that rate of uh, 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 producing uh, uh, toxic gases, what gonna happen to Earth? And uh, um, maybe um, uh, they, that way they, we make them care more about the environment. We have a section for children. Uh, children